Now we move into instrumental music and um, we have on the line with us Rupert Gunther, um, the violinist, composer and um, an improvisation um, expert um, who is um, touring his work New Letters to Esther Hazy. Rupert Gunther, welcome to Music in Melbourne. Good morning, Isabel. Thanks for having me on the show. Um, so... Um, improvisation is um, something that's become a bit disconnected um, from the classical music tradition in more recent years. Um, can you tell us about um, how your training um, sort of led you back into improvisation in a classical style? It's a good question. There's two things that have happened. One is that in the last couple of hundred years, um, most musicians have moved away from being composers to being just players. So that's the big shift is that there's far less composers, composer musicians than there were. I mean, all people like Bach, Handel, Mozart, Beethoven, they're all performer composers. And um, so what's happened with the specialisation in recent centuries is that people have stopped creating their own music. So that's a big part of it. And then within that, um, improvisation, well, improvisation is a form of composition, really. Um, just like a painter has a blank canvas and they paint strokes onto the canvas and then there's a picture. And um, that's what really how improvisation works in music as well. But um, in the classical sphere, um, I guess in the, until 150 years ago, perhaps a little more, um, improvisation, even in the increasingly um, performer-only realm, we had uh, people who were adepts at improvisation. They could play Mozart sonata and embellish all sorts of parts in it, not just ornaments, but entire sections. And uh, there's still people to this day who do that. It's more, I would call that extemporization. Mm -hmm. But improvisation, um, where we're creating the music, it really harks back to the time of the performer composers up until probably the um, uh, middle of the Romantic era and perhaps the end of it. Um, and so really what I'm doing is um, bringing that back to life, if you like. But to be clear, it's it's creating my own music. I'm not, a, I'm not improvising on Mozart or Beethoven. Mm. I'm creating my own music, but it's not... It's not random, you know, the word improvisation can have connotations for people. It's some sort of doodling, and it's far from it. It's it's intensely emotional and evocative um, music, just like painters paint pictures, you go and see their exhibitions. So that's the closest I can give you the story Yeah, beautiful. To answer your question. And, of course, your improvisation would be sort of embedded with your training as a virtuoso concert violinist in Vienna, and your time in Austria and um, your connection with the place. Indeed, and and this is an important part, and I'm glad you've brought this up, Isabel. Um, everywhere we go, we we're absorbing we're absorbing things in our environment. We absorb the the voices that even um, in our family that we we can detect the subtle changes in tone of voice when we're in trouble or when we're people are pleased with us, all these sorts of very rudimentary things, but on a on a sound level, we're taking in our environment all the time, and of course, um, for musicians to go somewhere in an environment such as Vienna, where the, um, not only the, the music culture is still very much alive in a very special way um, that links very directly um, with the great traditions going back hundreds of years, um, that's still very alive in a lot of places in Europe, and Vienna certainly one of them. And so being immersed in that, the training, of course, is something very special as well. I was very fortunate to uh, learn from um, some very, very good people. And um, But as much the way they play music, you know, the way they played Brahms, Mozart, Beethoven, um, Bach, whatever, they, there's, a, there's a special touch, and everywhere... The English have a special touch and the Austrians have a special touch and the, the Czech and Hungarian and Slovakian musicians have a special touch. So that if, wherever we end up, <clears throat> we're absorbing all these influences. And so um, I, I guess I've 
I bring that wherever I go, um, as every musician does. And from a compositional point of view, of course, because I'm creating my own music. And of course, all those sounds and that rich tradition, they're there. They're there in every breath. Mm. And so um, this work, New Letters to Esterhazy, um, so it's a sonata, um, but it's an improvised sonata, and it's depicting imaginary letters from you in the 21st century Australia back in time to Joseph Haydn in the 18th century. Um, can you speak to that um, process? Yeah, yeah. Well, um, it, it, as you said, it's a, it's actually a sonata in five movements, and... Um, <clears throat> Each each movement has a particular kind of emotional flavour to it, a particular kind of feeling, as music does. Each movement in a sonata, there's nothing new there. But um, again, I'm playing this, I'm painting my pictures live, mm -hmm. so it's a bit like coming to see an exhibition and you see the pictures being created and then by the end of it there's these five works on the wall. Beautiful. And so each of the five movements, do you have sort of an, I an idea or an image or a story um, to make it? Because you're performing this multiple times. Um, what makes That's it right. the same work? Yeah, this is a really good question. Um, like anything, our intention guides everything that comes out of our mouth or on, on, a, on an instrument. And if we were to give a talk on some topic... Um, we would have to have a focus or we'd just be words. So we have a focus that might be about Baroque music and then we can go into depth about that. So when when these pieces are being created live, I, I have a very specific intention with each movement, in fact, with the overall work as well. And it relates more to what I would call ideals than ideas. Um, an ideal is something that um, brings a, a particular picture a big picture rather than a tiny detail picture. And it, it's very similar to what the ancient Greeks, like Plato and Aristotle and all these people, um, were working with. They were bringing ideals for humanity. They were bringing hope. They were bringing... Um, they defined what suffering was and they defined what, what love was in the best ways they could. And so each of these movements is reaching extending some kind of um, gratitude towards my whole opportunity that I've had to be in Vienna and have all that training, but also to have walked those streets and played in the halls where Haydn wrote and premiered um, and his his works. And so these, are, if you like, they're, they're like a thank you mm. back through time to Joseph Haydn. And yes, each one might have a, a different characteristic like hope or sadness or you know, it's a journey. It's like a play. You've got to have the contrast. You can't just have all happy. It's got to have these bits so that we can really appreciate the depth of each one. Mm, yeah, beautiful. Um, so new letters to Esther Hazy. You'll be performing at the Melbourne Recital Centre in the Primrose Potter Salon on Wednesday, the 26th of July at 7pm. Um, Rupert, thank you so much for coming on the show. And yeah, I can't wait to hear this amazing work um, in Melbourne. You're very welcome and thank you for having me on this morning.